the podcast for the inquisitive diver. Hey there, dive buddies, and welcome to the show. So, one of the topics within scuba diving that I want to get into is technical diving. Now, I've done a lot of diving myself, uh, recreational. Um, played around with uh, a few of the tech toys, but never really delved into it in any depth. So rather than me jabbering on, I thought it would be a good idea to bring on a geezer that knows, well, as much as you need to know about tech diving, really. And he can talk us through why people get interested in tech diving. His name is Jeffrey Glenn. Um, Jeff, welcome to the show, buddy. How you doing, mate? Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me on Scuba Goats, mate. Nice to see you. Nice to talk with you. It's been a while. It's been a while. Too long. And how's the uh, how's the surf this morning? Oh, mate, it's pretty ordinary. <laughs> Five a.m. wake up, call, check the surf report. Poor. So <laughs> the sleep in was had. It was enjoyable. <laughs> uh, before we get into any depth, do you want to give um, the guys that are listening a background on yourself and you know what, how you got into the diving industry and, and where it's evolved to? Okay, yeah, sure, no problems at all, Matt. Um, so I, I started uh, with my open water course in in Ely Beach uh, close to 30 years ago. So I've been in the dive industry for some time, um, yeah. heading out to the Great Barrier Reef, uh, enjoying diving as much as I did. I proceeded and, and moved through the ranks and became a dive master up there. Um, enjoyed that, uh, travelled the world a little bit, uh, ended up in Egypt, on a liverboard through Tony Backhurst out of Guildford in England. And oh, yeah. um, I've just done a uh, liverboard on the Angelina and I uh, met this guy on the pier. He had a Kotal shirt on and I asked him about it. And um, he told me about it. Cool. Put that in the memory bank and then went back to the UK, worked a little bit more. And then when I decided to go on to become an instructor, I remember that t shirt. So Googled Kotal and off I went, did my instructor course. And um, what was this? That was in 20, 2000, 2000, March 2000, I went out to Kotal, did my instructor course. The, the idea, the plan was to um, do my instructor course and then move through to Central America where I could combine my love of surfing and, and diving um, and uh, work away in the tropics, but ended up staying on Kotal. Proceeded proceeded to, to teach open water courses, advanced courses, rescue, uh, for a good couple of years. Then became a little bored with it, so proceeded to become a Odyssey staff instructor and get myself involved with instructor development courses mm-hmm. um, with a couple of the, the leading course directors at the time there, Mark Walker and, and uh, Jonah Samuelson. Um, proceeded to do that. Um, then went to Kota Kinabalu in Borneo. Um, did my CD course, CDTC, uh, with a friend of ours, Guillaume Fargus, who's now working yeah. for Paddy in uh, America. Um, proceeded to that for a couple of years, instructor development, um, then doubled in the technical diving, um, where I absolutely fell in love with the challenges and the excitement that technical diving brought to me, mm-hmm. um, and then just focused on that for the last basically 10 to 15 years. Yeah, so, yeah, you've been doing it a, a little while, haven't you? Yeah, quite some time, quite some time. And the beauty of technical diving is that you're, you're continually learning. I felt with the recreational uh, sphere, you sort of get to a, a certain level and the progression just basically stops. There's not too much more you can do in the recreational realm. But with technical diving, it's it's continually evolving. The technology is continually developing. Mm. Uh, the toys... <laughs> <laughs> are continually improving um, and be- be- becoming um, uh, more enjoyable to use and, and it's allowing the exploration scope to, to widen. So, yeah, yeah, there's always something to do. So what was it that actually, was it the boredom of, of recreational repetitive instruction or was it the attraction of, of more exploration within within tech diving? I'm trying to just decipher what it is that draws people to technical diving. Okay, yeah, I, I think you've you summed it up nicely there, mate. For me personally, it was just the the boredom, the repetition, the the, the mediocrity of um, just doing the same thing on IDCs, yeah. ticking ticking the boxes on the evaluation cards and. And I, I just felt that, uh, you know, I was just like, uh, is, this, is this 
Is this it? it? Is this it? Yeah. There's got to be more to it. Uh, and at the same time, I started to uh, develop my technical skills and that was allowing me to go a little bit further in the overhead environments, go a little bit deeper in the wrecks. And I always came back from a day of technical diving fully pumped for more. Yeah. Whereas I can compare that to a day of IDCs, I was like, <sighs> right? <laughs> so I'm a guy that continually likes to develop and progress and evolve as, as, a, as a human, as a diver, and technical diving enabled me to do that, become better because mm. I was challenging myself. I didn't really feel that challenged after an IDC. Yeah. It was the same old, same old repetition. So, yeah, to summarise that, Matt, yeah, it was a repetition that sort of bored me of IDCs and recreational, whereas the excitement of being able to push my limits further in technical diving is it's what led me to transition fully mm. into technical diver development and technical exploration. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I, the, the the amount of people that you taught tech diving and, you know, people call it account certs and all that kind of thing, you've done a fair few now, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could say that. You could say that, yeah. I, I've probably done more technical diver certs than I have recreational certs. Yeah. Um, keep in mind, when I was working as a recreational instructor, I was representing probably the biggest scuba diving school on the planet, teaching a- so APEX, at band Bands Diving Resort on Kotel. You know, you're doing maximum ratio of eight students to one instructor, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. So to say that I've done just as many technical certs as recreational is giving you an idea of the, the, the broad range of students I've taught. That's Massively. that's gone from entry, entry level technical, mm. which is the soft tech, into the hard tech, which is the overhead and the rebreathers. So, yeah, I've done a, done a few. Happy days. And that was a, a beautiful lead in there. I'll drop you a fiver later. Um, can you – let's let's talk through – the way people get into tech diving because I was actually chatting with it with the missus this morning about it and I asked her as a, a recreational diver non-technical non um non-pro you know what do you know about tech diving and it's um it's as though there's a kind of mysterious shroud and you know those in the the recreational that slap a tank on every weekend don't really know that much about it without delving into the weeds so if you don't mind can we delve into the weeds of how people would start to get into tech and why? It starts with a conversation with people that do do tech. Um, there is a dark cloud hanging over tech at the entry level. People see that and they go, oh, I can't do that. So I think it's a mindset thing. They look at it and go, oh, too complicated, too challenging. Where in fact, the, the training isn't as complicated and challenging as it seems. Yes, it is more complex. You do have to focus more. It is a, a paradigm shift where you have to turn into a thinking diver, a proactive diver. As a, recre- as a recreational diver, you're, a, you're more a reactive diver. Um, people thrive on that because they do put their, um, their focus more on the preempting situations and being prepared for them as opposed to reacting to it. So... I think for me on Kotel, when I started my technical development, was seeing people on dive sites with a, with a set of doubles on their back or with side mount. And, and, and like anything, people are curious. They want to know about it. Then on the boat, during the surface interval or after the dive, you'll see the recreational divers on the boat looking at you. You know they want to ask questions. If they're confident, they'll come and ask you, what are you doing? How do I start that? And they're usually the ones that go, yeah, I want to give it a go. So they come and uh, introduce themselves and they sign up for the course and that beautiful journey of technical diving begins for them. So that's how I found from my experience that most people start their technical. Um, You would have seen like Andy Campbell on the boat, a big blue, with his uh, twin set on or his side mount and you would have seen new DMTs, looking at them going, oh, what are you up to? Um, I think also the rise of social media and seeing the, the the photos of yourself and, you know, Pete Mesley doing his photos and Thomson George's photos, well, there's those epic images 
um, of divers in caves. Like I know Mick has done a, some wonderful photos of me on the wrecks of Malta. People yeah. see those images and they go, oh, I want to be that guy. Because I, I remember when I started, I wanted to get that selfie of me in a twin set looking cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought the only way I'm going to get that cool photo of me in a twin set is if I do the course. So, you know, I saw also a little bit of ego at play there. You want to look cool on social media and that. Yeah. Um, so, but going back to your original question, I I think it's more just the exposure. When people see it, it ignites that curiosity. So people ask about it and that's how that's how they start. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's actually just that you're saying about the selfie or the photo. There's one that Miko took and it just springs to mind instantly when you talk about it. And it's I think it's the only photo I've seen of you with a big ear to ear smile underwater. Is that the one on the when I'm on the shot line? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll, if we go on YouTube, I'll put it here somewhere. Okay. So people can yeah, see. Yeah. Okay. That's no, cool. <laughs> that one. Um. That was a a wreck that we did on the HMS Olympus in Malta. Uh, the Malta Historical Society had literally just opened up that wreck to be diveable by civilians, and due to uh, Miko's infamy on the Thai K rescue, he was given um, the uh, privilege of being one of the first teams to go down on the Olympus. It was uh, a British submarine at 120 metres in Malta. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we are just coming up from a magnificent dive on, on that. It was funny, Gamiko was just playing around with his camera and just coincidentally I was just sitting above him watching him swear at me and finish. And, um, <laughs> yeah, he took that photo and that's actually one of my favourite photos of myself. As yeah. Well. yeah, Yeah, it's a fantastic shot. Yeah, nice one, Miko. Yeah. He's good for something and I'll finish, buddy. Isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> I miss Nico. <laughs> yeah. He's just got he just got back to the island actually, hasn't he? He like, certainly has, weeks. mate. Yeah. It, it cost him a small fortune to get there with all the restrictions in place. But yeah, he's back on Kotel teaching teaching courses again. Yeah. I was just chatting. I'm hoping to put hoping to put a visit in probably May time next year. Ooh. Yeah, 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 I'm looking to go back around the same time, mate. Oh, yeah? June, June, July, yeah. I need to start the business interests again there. That could, that could be quite, uh, quite just dangerous. Hope our, <laughs> just hope our borders are open, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I've to, uh, well, yeah, if you're going to do June, July, I'll make sure I do May then. So my liver's intact and <laughs> I leave. <laughs> mate, it might be hard to believe, Matty, but I'm a good boy these days, mate. Chopper's yeah, retired. <laughs> <laughs> we might introduce Chopper later to people. Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, back to training. Yeah. Uh, so, those people that you know they've approached you and they decide to come and have the chat and um, and get into the tech side of things. What's um, what's the overall benefits for those people that are going to start taking that first step? Yeah, good question. Good question, mate. The benefits uh, of technical diving. Uh, I think it's the knowledge. First and foremost, it's the knowledge that they pick up. Okay, in recreational diving, you don't you don't really drill deep into what diving is about, the psychological and physiological effects of diving. In in the technical introductory courses, you touch on that. What is actually the gas doing to your body? How is that affecting you? How do we eliminate that gas? So you, do, you delve deeper. Into, into the knowledge base of, of actual diving. So you actually know what the gases that you're breathing are doing as you're, as you're coming up. So then when you apply that knowledge, you have a greater understanding of why we do it. Okay, in recreation, I'll find this is what you do, you do it. But in technical, we go into deeper detail. So you have a more intimate understanding of why we do the things that we actually do. So in essence, you, you become a safer diver. Yes, and that's a, that's a point I wanted to raise, actually, because you, I think if, a lot of people will look at it and think that it's more dangerous getting into the technical realms. They think that once they understand and have a deeper, deeper and intermittent, inter, inter, intermittent knowledge of, of the diving, they become a safer diver. I, I feel much safer at 18 metres with a double, set of doubles on my back or a side mount than I would in a recreational setup. Yeah. Okay, and unfortunately, you know, you, you, you push to the recreational, you, you tick the box, you move on to the next course. Where in technical, you need to show a mastery at that level 
right, before the instructor will allow you to go to that next level. Yeah. Okay, which is completely different to the way the recreational um, realm is set up. So the understanding of what's actually happening and occurring on that dive, the, the planning involved with it, and then the execution of that dive gives you more confidence as a diver, gives you a more intimate knowledge as a diver, um, and the end result is you're a safer diver. Like I know if I'm at 80 metres with a twin set on and something goes wrong, it's like, oh, okay, just turn my valve off, switch to my short hose, okay, and then end the dive. Yeah. Whereas you see recreational dive, you have a catastrophic gas loss on that single tank, it's like, ah, <laughs> and you shoot up yeah. to the surface. Yeah. Right. So if I have a twin set on my back and I know how to operate that due to mastery of the skill of closing the valve down, switching to my short hose, signaling to my buddy that I have an issue, then I can just safely make up my way up to the surface knowing I've still got all my gas on my back. Yeah. So just going through that challenging aspect of learning how to do that, you will arrive at a, as a safe, as a safer diver, and that's introduced to you at the introductory courses. But the very first course, you'll go through those processes. And do you want to break down the introductory course? Um, most of the agencies do an introductory course. So I teach with uh, TDI, with Raid, and and with Paddy. Um, it's all called it's all called differently the courses that you do. But basically, the uh, introductory course is is uh, introduction to how a twin set works, the mechanisms of the twin set, how the valve works. Okay, so you have a failure on one side. Okay, you can just close it. You can isolate it. Okay, and then you have access to both cylinders. Okay, yeah. um, manipulation of the long hose and the short hose, uh, gas sharing. But I think what what I drill in most importantly on the introductory courses is the control in the water column. Okay, understanding buoyancy control, understanding the six propulsion techniques to be able to maintain um, your your control in the water column, which I think is um, the most beneficial for an introductory or a technical diver moving forward, having that control under the water, because you'll see you'll see a lot of recreational divers swimming like this. Or you see a well-trained technical diver will will have control, you know, be in trim and be able to um, execute the dive in control, will be able to ascend from the dive in control and be able to address any problems that they have in the water but still maintain control. And that, again, makes it safe. If you're having a gas loss or you're having a problem under the water and you do not have control, you're either sinking greater than your depth or your PO2 on your gas or you're ascending, losing control on your ascent because of mm. the overinflating wing. Yeah. Whereas if you have that control and can and manage your buoyancy while dealing with the multitude of issues that you might have to deal with, but still have that control, again, you're safe. Yeah. And that's what yeah. it comes down to, your safety. Safety. Uh, now, and I'm just picking up on something you said a few minutes ago. Um, recreational is ticking boxes. As long as you can do the skills and you're competent, you're meant to be. It's meant to be mastery, but you know, mastery is a. It's a. I think it's a loose. It's a very I broad term, in the foot, isn't it, mate? Because it is. It's my mastery. idea of mastery would be completely different to a recreational diver's of mastery. Definition, yeah. and that's the point. I'm that's yeah. the I'm, that's leading me to the next question is that if you have um, a customer that you're teaching and they tick the boxes per se, but you're still uncomfortable with that individual and signing them off, can you not? Can you hold off of signing them off? Yeah, for, through your own experience and thoughts on on how they are in the water. Yes, in in technical diving, um, and I believe it should be the same in recreational. Um, but in technical diving, we do have the luxury of not uh, certifying the diver if they do not meet the requirements required. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have had divers who haven't um, met the performance requirements to my satisfaction. Yeah. But even though I've had interns with me and I've asked them the question, how did you think they went? Oh, they went well. And I'm like, mm, I'm, I'm sorry, I would disagree with you there. 
this diver will have to spend another another day with me in the water and that days will be continuous until they meet the requirements and I find most technical divers or most students who are moving into the technical realm are quite comfortable with that if they need more training. Um, I'm usually brutally honest with them. You haven't met requirements as yet. I would like you to have another day. Yeah, Jeff, no problems. Let's do it because they want to be better. Yeah. And, they, they and, and, be better. And, and, and let's face it, I mean, the worst thing that comes out of it is you get an extra day of diving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and usually, Matt, that's all they need, hey? Yeah. Because what happens on those – on that final day, that evaluation day, this gets away on them. Yeah. And they overcomplicate it, they overanalyze it, and they get anxious. And it's yeah. usually up here, that fear up here, that that usually leads to them not having the day they wish for. Yeah. So once they get through that day, the next day is usually a little bit better because they, they've, they've gotten through the previous day. It hasn't worked for them. They know what's expected of them. Okay, and they usually meet it with fine colours right the next day, eh? Yeah, yeah. It's just that time in the water. Yeah. It is. It's it's, it's experience, isn't it? You're getting relaxed with it. It is, mate. It is. And as you know from the recreational uh, film of in Kotel, mate, that um, you, you, you've you got time pressure on you, mm-hmm. right? People come in on the holiday with a backpack on. They've got three and a half days to do their open water course. You know deep down that maybe they they haven't met their requirements, but because you got pressure from the from the dive shop from the student, you tick that box and you move them on. Yeah, yeah. Um, those students who then come on to the technical training, you really got to let them know that it, it's it's not a time based, it's performance based uh, yeah. evaluation criteria. And if they haven't met the requirements, they will need to to have another day with me. Another two days, and I think it's fair to say as well. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that from what I've seen over the years, and you know, watching the likes of Richard Deveni teaching, mm. it's a much more intimate um, teaching style. That you know, it's smaller groups, and you know, well away from the madding crowd, and and more focused as um, as you would expect. So, it's more, yeah, it is. It, it appears more intimate, more more controlled. It is. It's. Um... As a as an instructor, you know who teaches cave courses, who teaches you know advanced trimics rebreather courses. You you are very intimate with your student. You're at a hundred meters. You're you're on top of them. You're pretty mm. much riding them. You're there. You're watching everything that they do. <laughs> you're 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 delving deep into their soul. Yeah. You're at a hundred meters. Something goes wrong. You're like as close to this monitor. As we are now to their eyes, you're you're seeing what they're thinking in their eyes. So yeah. after you've both gone to that experience together, yeah, you're you're, you're quite intimate, and yeah. it's actually forms really strong friendships yeah. with Definitely. your students. You know, you're not the way the way I see it, Matt. When I'm teaching my students, I'm not just teaching students; I'm teaching future dive buddies for myself. Yeah, because I'm I'm teaching them utilizing every resource that I've got with the hope that they'll come and join me in my expeditions and my exploration projects later because the more of my mates that I can dive with, the, the happier I am, you know. Exactly. The more people that I can get into technical diving and show them what I, I'm fortunate enough to see, you know, and and what technical diving has given me the opportunity to see, the more people that can see that, the more love to pe- technical diving there will be out there. But yeah, it is quite intimate, mate. It is quite intimate. But it's one on one, and it's a it's a complete paradigm shift from recreational or technical. Mm. You know, it's such a such a higher level of skill that's required to to be a competent diver. Yeah, you know, us, and that's and that's not saying you know people who listen to this now. It's it's not a it's not a scary level. I mean, you're taken from point A as a recreational diver to point B as a new technical diver and your your puppy walks all the way absolutely so that they've got that that absolutely. skill and, and that comfort yeah absolutely it's a step-by-step progress you know it's like the japanese business philosophy the kaizen the kaizen way it's a book yeah. by robert Muron, and, and something i apply with a lot of my different aspects of life just baby steps achievable steps so then you arrive at the the big picture with that foundation there mm-hmm 
you know. So it is a step-by-step -step progress. You know, if, if day two of the technical diving course is unsuccessful, then we do day two again. Yeah. And day yeah. second day of day two isn't successful, then we do day two again before we go to day three and, and so on. So by the time they get to that, say, 45-metre certification point, they're competent. Right, and the only time I sign them off is, is like, am I comfortable with this person by themselves at 45 metres? Yes, I am done. You're certified. And it, it is a step-by-step -step progress. And it's a great journey. It's a it's a rewarding journey because there's yeah. going to be times where you're like, uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> but usually by the end of it, when you get to experience that wreck at 45 metres for 25 minutes and you've taken some Instagram shots, you know, underwater and you've come up and you've just done a dive which you've doubted yourself on and you've come up just buzzing, yeah. that confidence level of the dive which has gone sky high. Yeah. But, yeah, it is a step-by-step -step walk walk with baby step progress through to that point. Yeah. And that so – that that first int the introduction to tech, that, that's going to be um, doubles. Is doubles the the, the start of everything? Um, Matt, my my look on it is that I prefer to start with doubles because because that's how technical diving started. Okay, right. I know there's a lot of energy these days with side mount. So yes, you can do that introductory on side mount, um, but um, I prefer to do it on Twin sets on doubles, okay. So, because um, what I'm what I'm angling at is, it, you know, just thinking back to that discussion with the misses this morning, that 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 dark cover. Unless you delve into, you know, a particular instructor when you're searching out to do tech diving, you don't really know the route through the ranking structure, as it were, the development structure. So, you know, I picked up on the, the the twin sets that you're talking about on the doubles at, at side mount. So it can be an it can be an option that the student wants to follow, or is it a preference from the instructor side of the house? A a side mount instructor will always push side mount. <laughs> uh, older school, um, uh, chiselled, salty sea dog may go a, a set of doubles. Yeah. But for me, a, a well rounded technical instructor needs to be proficient in both side mount or back mount yeah. and and switch seamlessly between the two. Yeah. So if your lovely lady came up and said, Jeff, I want to start my technical diving route, I'd be comfortable saying, which tool would you prefer to use first, side mount or back mount? Um, the reason I like to do the back mount is anything really beyond the 50-metre mark side mount becomes a little bit more of a challenge because of the singular tanks. Yeah. With all your gas on the back, it allows a little bit more freedom at the front. Yeah. Whereas if I'm going to 50, 60 metres plus, I've got five cylinders at the front of me on side mount. So it becomes a little bit more challenging. So when people come to me and ask they want to do tech, I'll say, what's your end goal? Is it caves? Is it 100 metres? Is it, is it this or is it that? And using that information that they've answered that question on, then I'll say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is what I recommend that we do. Okay. Um, so the um, the route through to the end goal can be structured um, bespoke almost. Pretty much, pretty much. And how I used to structure things on Kotel was um, they would come to me, I'll do an introduction. Um, I would do technical days with my DMTs. Just take all the all the toys up to the swimming pool, um, and then give them an opportunity to play with the side mount, play with the doubles, and play with my rebreathers. Okay. Um, but I found like probably seventy percent of the students that wanted to start their technical would like to do side mount first. So if they were coming to me to do the entry level tech, then the forty five meter tech, and then the extended range tech, we would do the side mount through to forty five meters. Okay, where I have my side mount cylinders plus one decompression cylinder. Um, and then I would veer over and do my extended range training on a, on a set of doubles. A uh, set of doubles with, um, with your 50% and your, and your 100%. Um, and now they've just done the entry level basic tech to 55 metres, which is the extended range. And now they're comfortable in both side mount 
and back mount. Now they've got that practical experience to draw from, they can then decide which route they want to specialise in for their future training. Yeah, yeah. So right. I'll give them the opportunity to do both. Yeah. So um, you've got your, your your students, you know, they've got their 55 ticket. Um, what Was it extended range, isn't it? Yeah, you the extended range. Uh, with TDI, it's extended range. With, with RAID, it's the RAID 60 program. Yeah. Um, and with Paddy, it's the Tech 50 program. Right. Now, a lot of people that in the recreational side of the house, one of the one of the most common things I hear when you know tech diving comes up is that the phrase of uh, "why go so deep?" What's the point? What is the point? Exploration, curiosity, scientific reasons. Okay. You've been involved in a few of the scientific things now, haven't you? Yeah, a few of them. Um, the plan was, pre-COVID, was to get more involved with uh, Major Project Foundation. <laughs> uh, with, with Matt Carter. With Matty Carter, who's going to be one of the divers. With Matt. Um, in fact, we just finished Matt's crossover onto the JJ. He uh, did his course with me down at uh, Killsby Sinkhole in uh, Mount Gambia just recently um, with the objective to utilise the JJ for some of the scientific projects that he had in Truck Lagoon and Bikini on the wreck set. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the reasons people want to go deeper is um, it's for that very purpose. Is um, There's some cool stuff down deep, eh? There's some cool yeah. stuff down there. <laughs> You'll find that a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of wrecks between the 60 to 40 metre range that you just can't access as a um, recreational diver. Yeah. Um, some of the sinkholes around the world go a little bit deeper, so you, you can't push the exploration um, and bypass those deeper sections. You need to be trained in decompression procedures to, to be able to access those passages to continue the exploration. And also uh, the scientific projects on the marine life and the, the reef ecosystem um, that, for example, um, Mark was doing in uh, in Indonesia, some of the scientific projects uh, he was doing in the 80 to 100 metre range on the reefs um, uh, in Tunambay, right. up the north there. Yeah, so there's a lot of projects and a lot of scientific research and a lot of exploration out there on those deeper areas. So um, having the skills necessary to access uh, that part um, safely um, is, you know, obviously why people move into technical diving. Yeah. Uh, so let's touch back on safety as well. Um I make no bones about it. I think um, there's a lot of recreational divers out there that become blasé and overconfident when they're diving, particularly shore dives because it's just shallow. Um, and I see far too many people that just go solo diving that haven't got any backup uh, supplies. There's no buddies, no, no, no assistance mm. at all. I think it's bloody ridiculous. <laughs> but um, I do want to touch on um raid and the and the tuition in in rec recreational raid i i i am impressed with the way that the recreational raid system works when it's taught properly again it all comes down to the instructors that are, that are available to provide it but i also think it gives a good lead into the technical aspect because it is tech minded um are you allowed to agree, disagree with that without pissing off Paddy and TDI? <laughs> um, my, my, my thoughts is this when I enter a course and teach, there's great things that Paddy do, there's great things that TDI do, there's great things that uh, Ray do, there's great things that GUE do. So having an intimate knowledge of each of the different agency systems, I, I utilise all those tools and present them to my divers, right? Okay. So... Um, at this point in time, I'm not single agency affiliated, but I use all of them. Yeah. I'm an IT for Paddy, RAID, and TDI, and they all have great systems that I utilize. Yeah. To, so you can, to you make can cherry my, pick the exactly, specific exactly, to make, benefit. To make my students the best they can be mm. at that level of certification. Okay. Yeah. So um, I like the RAID system because it borrows heavily from the technical realm. Mm. Okay, with foundational skills. 
um, holding it, holding uh, the position in the water column while dealing with a basic skill of mass removal and replacement. They can do that while holding neutral buoyancy. Now, I, I'll go back to, to my days as a recreational instructor going back 20 years. On, on dive three of the open water course, Matt, we would swim around twins. It's time for them to remove their mask. We would go and find a nice sandy spot. Mm-hmm. We'd all go and kneel down on the sand, hold each other's hand, keep the group tight, and then one by one we would go to them and get them to remove the mask. Does that sound familiar, Matt? Bang on. Okay. Yep. So my issue with doing it that way is that once that diver is certified, they go to jump on pinnacle for a fun dive. They're at 18 metres and their mask gets watery. They need to take it off. What is their default setting then? Yeah, it's fantastic. to go and find a sandy spot to kneel down and remove and replace the mask. There's no sandy spot at Champagne Pinnacle at 18 metres. The nearest sandy spot is 30. Yeah. Is that safe? Not at all. So what Ray does is spend more time in the confine, mastering the ability to maintain your integrity in midwater while doing a very basic skill of mask removal and replacement. They do that in confined. They're not doing two-hour confined sessions to conflict. They're getting the student to master that. So that means three-hour, four-hour, five-hour confined session. If not all-day confined sessions, it makes dive, dive one and two, dive three and four so much easier for the student and the instructor because they've been developed um, with the technical mindset that they can hold that position. Yeah. Right? So when they do swim at 18 metres at Champagne, oh, my master's got some water and I need to remove and replacement. They have the confidence in their ability to stay in that position and do that skill without jeopardising the safety. Yeah. And that's why I think RAID is is a is predominantly leading the quality of training with, with some of the agents. So I know TDI is doing it now. Some of the guys at Paddy are, are following suit as well because they're just seeing that it can be done. Yeah. It just means the instructor needs to spend a little bit more quality time with the students in the confined water training. Yeah. If that means minimising the ratios, so instead of teaching eight to one like I did for so many years, minimise that to four to one. So then you can have that intimate relationship that we discussed previously that a technical diver has, have that with the recreational diver. Why not? Let's teach four to one concentrate more on those fundamentals or those foundational skills and they're going to be a better safer diver yeah was that your phone yeah i'll turn it off sorry brother that's a, that's a case of beer you owe me <laughs> <laughs> so every time the bell rings i need to give you a case of beer <laughs> oh yeah chopper's bar is going to be yeah, closing ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. Yeah, cool. So, what's um, what, what's what's next um, after the fifty-five? You know, if someone's got out, they've got the confidence, got the skills. What what are they going to start looking towards? Mm. You'll find a lot of divers may not want to go any further, mate. Okay, they've got the necessary skills, whether it be side mount or or set of doubles to stay in that forty to sixty meter range. I mean, that, that's a magnificent depth, 40 to 60 metres. You get to see so much more and it opens up more more doorways to more adventure for you. Um, but, you know, if you do wish to go on, then then we usually have a, a quite detailed discussion whether it wants to be open circuit or remain on open circuit or we transition into a rebreather. Right. Okay. So beyond the, the extended range, which is the, you know, the 40 to 60 metre depth, that discussion sort of needs to be, needs to be prominent yeah. in, the, in the thought process because um, there's a big difference, right? Mm. Um, moving on to the open circuit, uh, you have the skills in place already to easy execute 100 metre. Again, it's baby steps to 100 metres. There's a lot of training dives and execution of training dives before we hit that magical 100-metre mark. Um, but then if we 
decide to transition into rebreathers, um, it's a complete paradigm shift. You have to, <laughs> you have you have to accept that you're basically going back to square one and, yeah, yeah. and restart your training again. So yeah. um, if someone comes to me, they're certified to the extended range of forty to sixty meters, and they want to progress, then I'll sit down and say, right, these are the these are the options. We can stay on open circuit, or we can pre- progress into rebreathers. Now, um, on the rebreather front, let, let's start talking rebreathers. Oh. Pretty damn sexy. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we're now getting into the expensive realms. Oh, but, yeah. Um, there's a lot of advantages now. <laughs> the, to get onto a rebreather, to, to learn how to use a rebreather, do they have to go through all of the precursors, the intro to tech, the doubles, the side mount, all that kind of, or is there a, a direct route to rebreathers? Good question, Matt. Good question. Um, this is an ongoing debate uh, amongst uh, agencies, amongst instructors from different agencies. Um, yes, there is a direct route. Yes, you can go straight on to what they call a recreational rebreather and start your entry into tech using a rebreather. Um, or you can go the open circuit route to extended range and then progress over, okay? Um, Depending on the instructor, okay, some instructors, it may be financially advantage to them to suggest the rebreather early on because they may have a student who wishes to buy the rebreather straight away, all right? They may be an instructor who would rather just tick and flick, get them through, get them through the door, okay? but then you may have an instructors who wish for the student to have the fundamental skills in place, yeah. understand what buoyancy is, understanding what the gas is doing to you. Yeah. See that that student has a, a has developed that situational awareness and is comfortable at those depths before overtasking them with the intricacies of the rebreather at those depths. Yeah. So coming from from my experience when I'm having these discussions with my students and they wish to proceed under rebreathers, I always get them to go to extended range level on open circuit. Because mm. once they're comfortable at 50 metres on the twin set and they're nailing and executing every single dive and they're relaxed and they're coming up and they're just buzzing, then I say, yeah, you're ready to move on to rebreathers. Yeah. If if they're at fifty and they're all over the place, the buoyancy is not on point. They're not they're not having good team communication. Their awareness is is minimal. Then I'm like, dude, there's no way that I will allow you to go to fifty meters on a rebreather. Yeah, because it's just a whole another level. Is is that one of the dangers? Is it, um, you know if someone's certified to fifty on open circuit, um, when we go over to rebreather, is it does the the Depths qualification depths reset, or are they automatically allowed to use a rebreather down to fifty? So they they would need to go through the steps on the rebreather. So if they're, for example, a, a raid sixty diver, then they would need to start as a rebreather forty diver first and get the hours up before they can then move on to the next program. So it's not a like-for-like certification. Good, good. I'm just trying to draw out all of the thoughts that, you know, go through my head and probably someone like the message as well. So for me, for me going through the (coughs) processes of the open circuit uh, journey, you've, you've mastered the buoyancy and understanding the trim, the propulsion techniques, and the awareness of what's going on around you, okay? Mm -hmm. So those skills are sort of squared away and you've got them in your pocket already. You then transition onto a rebreather. The initial course, the entry level rebreather course is all about the unit, understanding the intricacies and the the, uh, intimate details of how the actual machine works. Yeah. Okay, knowing that you have the foundational skills already. Okay, I'm not teaching you a rebreather and buoyancy. 
a rebreather and how to do a back kick or a helicopter turn because you have that already. I'm just yeah. focusing on the rebreather, knowing that you have those skills already, those foundational skills in your pocket already. And when we're and in the water, it. you can just pull them out. Yeah. And this is where you, you've got particular qualifications for a particular rebreather because they've all got their own systems. Exactly, exactly. So if you if you choose the JJCCR, then we just focus solely on the JJCCR. Mm. And then you might go through the entry-level JJ course, then you go into the mixed gas course, and then you go into the advanced mixed gas course. And then if you wish to move over and transition onto the XCCR, you have to do a crossover program onto the XCCR. So it's like a five- or six-day crossover program, understanding the intricacies of that particular unit. Yeah, yeah. Because the electronic system may be different, the heads-up display may be different, the way that you bail out and and, and, and do a, um, a diluent flush may be different or will be different on each of the different rebreathers. Yeah. So just because you have a rebreather certification on a particular unit doesn't mean that you can dive every single unit. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's like passing your test on a mini and jumping in a Lambo. Yeah, you need to understand how, <laughs> how each of the cars work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, let's um, let's back it up a little bit. Um, rebreathers, people that are interested, curious, um, scared of, uh <laughs> what's the what, let's let's have a bit of an overview on the advantages of a, a rebreather over an open circuit okay time 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 yeah. okay so you have time on the unit you have the time on the unit usually um if something goes wrong in open circuit you don't have much time because you're losing your gas hmm. right if something goes wrong on the unit which is very very rare all you do is look at your handset, and if the gas that you're breathing is a safe gas, then you have the time to go, okay, my gas I'm breathing is safe. What's my problem? Then you can analyze the steps to isolate what your problem is, okay, diagnose that, and work out your solution. So it allows you time. It allows you time. Yeah. So that for me is a, is a big thing. It's a little bit more That's relaxed. Yeah. Um, and the and the um, the no bubbles thing is a a big yeah, thing. Yeah, I know it sounds a little bit yeah, but it's no, it's true. If you're it's if, true. if you're into the photography, then having zero bubbles coming out, you're going to get so much closer to the species. Unbelievable, you're trying to... mate! It's unbelievable. I, I remember when I started my journey um, on on the rebreather, and I was getting up my hours, and um, I was on uh, Southwest. And Kotal, Southwest Pinnacle, and I, and I was just off the pinnacle at thirty meters, just looking at my handset, just playing around. And I, I just remember looking up once, and I had the the yellow tail barracuda, um, oh, yeah. like you know, hundreds of them, just like literally that far away from me. <laughs> and I, I got, I was a little little shot. I was like, oh, <laughs> and the little girl, they put my hand against my chest like this. <laughs> but I was just like, oh wow, they're so close to me. And the fact that I was just so silent, I was just became one of one in their environment. So they're just going, hey, what's this thing in black? So they just come very close to me. And if I had a camera, then Matt would have been would have been awesome because yeah. I would have got some great shots. But yeah, just leading into to what you said as a photographer, and you'll see some of the world's leading photographers. They also happen to be rebreather divers as well, don't they? Yeah. So it's it's a it's a wonderful tool. For that avenue of um, photo underwater photography, yeah, definitely. And and you can use rebreathers to. Is there a maximum depth or is it unlimited? Un unli unlimited, unlimited on on rebreathers. Depends how how bored you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's unlimited. I, I mean, um, uh, I, I may may brag a little bit here, but I was part of the the team for Will Goodman. Yeah. When he did 300 metres on um, out-of-the-box JJCCR, he went yeah. to 300. I was his deep support diver. So, yeah, the, the depth limit on the rebreathers are unlimited. But obviously, um, you know, Will had 10 years of rebreather experience under his belt before he, he executed successfully that dive. But, yeah, there is a there is a, is not a depth limit on rebreathers. I'm going to pick up on that. The, um, the dive itself, um, at what point? 
at what depth did he end up being on his own? Um, the, the way the way that the dive went on the day, Matt, was um, we um, we had planned it uh, after a month of training together. Um, for that day, uh, Will went down by himself. And then when he hit his mark, he, he started coming up and we timed it that I then went down with Simon Lydiard so we'd meet him as he was ascending and then we were coming down. Okay. So he, he probably spent close to um, 15 minutes by himself before I got hold of him, maybe 20 minutes. I was with him within 20 minutes of his descent. Yeah. And I was, I was having a quick look at some articles oh, this morning, actually, and um, he was saying that all his computers and whatnot just uh, maxed out at like 250 or something. Yeah, 280 they went out, but then they kicked back in. No, 290, sorry. Okay. If you have a look some of the imagery from his uh, record, world record, that um, his – his handset from his JJ maxed out at 290. Right. But um, once we uploaded the data, the data into the Shearwater software, um, we were able to see the, the actual lines. Um, it just stopped recording on the interface, but the actual uh, depth was recorded on, on the actual software. Yeah. The, uh, the, one, the one that actually worked was his uh, $100 uh, Scuba Pro. Um, depth bottom and depth timer, so that was still working for him. So he was able to um, make sure he hit the depths using using that uh, tool. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Are you a shearwater diver yourself? Oh, that's the only one I really use, mate. I um, I started using um, OSTC computers initially. First one failed, second one failed, third one, I was like, ah, sold it on. And at this time, Shearwater was just getting a little bit of energy about them. So my initial Shearwater purchase was one of those big bulky petrols oh, yeah. and that obviously um, they streamlined them down to what you see today. But, yeah, I, yeah. I use Shearwaters. Um, Shearwater Perdix is, is my go-to open circuit computer yeah. and also on my uh, JJ on my XCCR and on my SF2 rebuilders are uh, uh, Shearwater uh, Petrol 2s. Um, yeah. It's it's pretty much the only computer that I would recommend. Um, yeah. I reckon them, recommend them due to the fact that they've always worked for me in 20 years of technical diving. They've never let me down. Um, so that's why I recommend them. There's other good computers out there, but for me it's it's only ever going to be a Shearwater. I did, I did the jump over. In fact, the logo on the on the podcast cover it's the Tarek. oh look at you yeah uh, sexy, is it? Uh, sexy that, isn't it <laughs> you, you should ring up bruce and see if you can be a she water model my friend <laughs> yeah. yeah this old goat needs some sponsorship <laughs> <laughs> what what mask do you have on there oh that's um that's an aqualung there you go and Amy jackson's obviously <laughs> Jet fins, yeah, very good. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I made the made the mistake last weekend. We went camping up at uh, our Putty Beach, uh, just an hour and a half north of here, and uh, lovely weekend. But I took me took me jet fins with me in the boots. Just thought I'd chuck out onto the uh, onto the shoreline there because I've just got uh, upgraded my camera kit gear and the iClight and the eight inch dome port. And I thought I'll give it a go on some half and half shots. But we'll check the water conditions first. And I got in with the, the jet fins on. And have you ever tried snorkeling with jet fins? Doesn't work, mate, does it? Oh, mate. <laughs> I might as well just go and do 10 spots in the gym with 100 kilos on your back. Two bricks on your feet at the surface, <laughs> mate, you know. <laughs> they look but, great underwater, mate, but not very effective on the surface, eh? Oh, no. Yeah. Well, I'm leaving here today and I'm heading down to Adrena. I'm just going to pick up some. Uh, I don't know, some Avanti Quattros or something for the for the snorkeling okay. next time we go camping. Yeah, nice. Avanti Quattros, yeah. That's one of the Mares fins that I, I would recommend for tech. Yeah, I love Avanti Quattros love are them. quite good, mate. Yeah. yeah. I was I was yeah. teaching them all the time before I got these ones. Yeah, same. I had a bright yellow pair of Avanti Quattros. <laughs> and then I moved over to the OMS fins. But, yeah, the Jets fins, mate, they, um, they, were, li- they were sort of life-changing for me once I got into the tech. Yeah. It's so important to have an effective fin. 
Yeah. Because your propulsion is you can either make or break a dive. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Propulsion Thanks. techniques and making sure you have the right fins to, to get the propulsion that you need, whether it be a a, a delicate back kick or, a, you know, a, a powerful frog kick. You know, you need good fins. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. But that doesn't happen at the surface. No. At the surface, you're just an elephant with... Well, not <laughs> <laughs> Especially with our speedos on. Oof. Oh, yeah. Oh, anyway, okay. Let's get back into the tech side of things, All right, shall we? Buddy. Um, what's um, just picking up? You saying that you're going to be heading back out to Thailand, hopefully next year. Um, what's the, what's the plans? Are you going to are you going to get back out to teaching? Um. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of fifty fifty on that at the moment. Um, I think I think what I what I have to do is um, commit to the projects that we had planned pre COVID. Um, one of those projects with was with Miko, yeah. with our um, NGO bottom line projects, and Miko's uh, the leader of. Um, we will be um, photogametry ing. <laughs> the the USS um, uh, what was the boat the um, oh hang on mate um, Legato sorry have to edit that bit out yeah we'll be um, doing um, some survey work uh, for the US Department of Defense for the USS Legato uh, last April was the seventy fifth anniversary of its sinking where is that one Legato it's in the Gulf of Thailand just off okay. um, Malaysia. So it's a submarine, USS Legato submarine that was uh, sunk in uh, the war during World War Two, um, bombed by the Japanese. Um, just, um, it, just watch you you're tapping on the oh, desk sorry, there, Jeff. Sorry. It's picking up on your mic. Sorry, yeah, you're doing a Steve Vessel. He was doing the same last Steve time. Steve Vessel. Oh, <laughs> so um, yeah, a couple of the Cotel boys found that. Um, funny enough, they they got in touch with the powers uh, that be in the US, and they were like. No way, a couple of the boys from Co Towers found that wreck that we've been looking for for 50 years. Yeah. Um, so they went back out, <clears throat> dropped down, grabbed the bell, took a photo, <laughs> sent it back, sent it back to them, gone, We found it, boys. <laughs> <laughs> With, within a day, they, they sent out a, uh, a ship from uh, one, of their, one of their naval bases in Singapore, we met them on site. They sent their own divers down to confirm the find, and okay, we found it. This is the one. So it actually gave a lot of closure to the families of the yeah. sailors that were on that wreck. So last April was the 75th anniversary of the sinking of that. So we had given were given the rights or, 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 and the authority to do some photogametry on the wreck and also put a plaque in memory of the gentleman that found it and also put up the American flag back onto the bow. So I th- think because of COVID that obviously we was put on pause. Mm. Um, so it was uh, Ben Remnants, Eric, Miko, Eric, Eric Brown and myself that were going to um, be the divers on that project with a, with some support from like Chrissy Haslam and Timmy Lawrence and that sort of thing. So um, I think we're going to go and do that. Um, we've also got a couple of projects to do in Croatia and Italy with uh, Patrick uh, Wedman and um, some of the boys that are based over there. Um, and, Maybe even head back to Mexico as well for a little bit, of t- a little bit of time in the caves. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Be- before yeah. I before I think about settling somewhere and teaching for a while, um, even though I'll be teaching in those those areas, um, I think I just need to get my dive mojo back on. It's yeah. been, uh, it's well, been- got some fantastic shots in um, in the um, Sonotes in Tulum, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I've been, been fortunate to dive with some really cool people over there. Yeah, got a got a lot of mates there. That um that are currently diving every day, putting out photos on social media, which are making me extremely jealous and envious that we're in Alcatraz and can't go anywhere. <laughs> but yeah, I'll be heading back there. There's a lot of good people over there in Mexico, a lot of good people there in Europe that are that are tech divers. And the beauty of the technical community that it's it's very welcoming and and very small that you get to know a lot of people very quickly. Um, and um, it's it's a wonderful opportunity and lifestyle. Um, and being a technical diver has, you know, opened up so many different doorways throughout the world of different places that you can dive where you get to meet all these really cool, interesting people as well. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I think well, I we, wanna... we stayed. Um, we did. Well, it was just before the year before COVID. Um, yes. Me and the missus did five weeks through, through Galapagos and yeah. back up, you and we ended up at Clare. And yeah, and you did, and they're ex-military as well, Matt. So yeah, you have yeah. a connection there. Yes. Yeah. yeah I remember you. Um, you sent me a, a Facebook message oh, yeah. you sent me a little video of yourself there just rub- rubbing it in while i was yeah. rafting away on the beaches of hotel <laughs> no i remember that yeah yeah it's an amazing place over there eh? amazing place. yeah great i mean we were only there for what three or four days but um it was certainly interesting um for me being you know photo geek i, I was more interested in the entry and exit points because oh, there was lights, lights and yeah for sure yeah yeah. Um, but the the pit was just simply fantastic. How good is that? How good are those photos of people in those light race just looking back? Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. Magical. Well, those those ones that I was talking about, the ones that that, that you're in, you've got the stalactites and the stalagmites, and you know, you've clearly the team have have put their um, strobes in place so that they flash off at the right time. But they're just they're awesome. Yeah, that's right. Eh? Um, the the divers, the divers that I'm I'm with, you know, S. J. Bennett, uh, Thompson George. Um, I'm nodding. I don't know them. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're on social media. They um, yeah. they have fantastic photos. You know, um, a lot of them use uh, video lights. Actually, Matt, they don't use the strobes because they um they know the passages they're swimming through from previous previous dives, so they're quite intimate with those those areas. So then they they pause the model, they set up the video lights where they need to, and then they get the model to to swim through that section. Yeah, yeah. So they're very they're very intimate with those areas. So it's you know very safe. They know exactly, you know the the compass bearing of the cave, the where the lines running. So they're very safe there. So, well, speaking of safety and cave, since we're touching on caves, um, and harping back. So we're talking about the intimacy of training. Um, I think Lanny and Claire have their setup it's good as a good example of what I'm trying to explain there because it's away from the Madden crowd. It's 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 focused because you're in your own compound and you know all that training can occur without distraction. Mm. And I think that's what you need for for that kind of um, adventure. You know, once you're going into an overhead environment. It's got to be completely focused, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, it is. It is focused training because um, you need that focused execution to to be seamless. So it it is very you know maximum groups three because um, that's the ideal team size in a cave. Okay. Um, so no more than three. Um, the instructor's always hovering meters away from the diver um, in well travelled caves. Yeah. So the the cave instructor has their set caves that they go to for each of the different training dives because they know that tr- that training cave intimately. So yeah. then they can drill down on the focus of the diver skills in that particular section of the training. Yeah. Um. Because obviously, as the instructor, you don't want to be worried about oh, which way's out, which way's that, which way's this. Your your focus is, is on the on the students. So if you do have a moment, you can easily look up at the environment. Okay, I know exactly where I am. This is what I need to do. It's a decisive action. Um, but yeah, it's very, it's very focused, and that's that's something that you have to you have to accept when you're moving your technical. Is yeah. that your your instructor is going to get close to you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's why I say that is because I've had several students say to me uh, on debris. Because um, a lot of the times I ask them to brief the dive, debrief the dive, yeah. just to see where they're at and what their thought processes were. And a lot of them say, you know, um, you got very close to me, Jeff. I, I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> and I'm like, you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, mate. I'm yeah. there to be your safety net if something goes wrong. And once they get that through their head, they're they're okay with it. Yeah. And then you you transition into the cave environment where there are like procedures where we practice going through restrictions where you are very intimate with your teammate, you know, and once they, they bring down that wall, they're like, okay, cool. Yeah. Because it is, it is a feeling of comfort. Hey, I mean, you know, when you're a child, 
when you're feeling uncomfortable, your parent picks you up, right, and holds you. When you're in a cave and you think the world's going to end, you feel the touch of your teammate or the instructor, it automatically, ah, someone's here, yeah. I'm okay. So it's just a matter of getting comfortable with the intimacy of the training. And you'll see with uh, Claire and Lenny's, you know, they have a wonderful compound there where they, you know, focus on the, the technical training of caves and and open open sea diving. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see the students um, enter the course, you know, fearful, uh, anxious, <laughs> questioning themselves. And then eight days later, they're a full cave diver and they're just yeah. like, wow, unbelievable confidence. Yeah. It, it is an achievement because it really um, challenges challenges yourself, challenges oh, challenges that, all the negative thoughts that you have. I can't do this. Well, you just did it. Oh, yeah, I can do this now. You know, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's a, a particular kind of person that wants to do caving though, isn't it? I mean, I, I had those little, those few dives and I played around with, you know, caves a little bit and you know you shouldn't play around but not to any great depth um but for me i prefer the open space the fish yeah. the wrecks um I, I don't get the the excitement as much with caves and that's just me being honest i'm sure there's people out there that will be screaming by now going you know nothing <laughs> well <laughs> caves my, are awesome my reply to that matt you haven't been to the right cave yet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'll have to be honest, and every every time I go into a cave, I'm fearful. You know, I'm like yeah. anxious. You know, I've got a hundred voices in my head going. But as soon as you get in there and you look around and you think, "Wow, look how big these caves are!" Yeah, and you're like, "Oh wow, look at that! Look at that! Look at that!" And before you know it, within minutes, you're not even fearful anymore. You're just like, "Cool, look at this stuff I'm looking at." Because <laughs> you're diving into history, Matt. You're diving into history. Yeah. Like I've, I've been fortunate enough to do some exploration dives in in Mexico mm -hmm. to unexplored passages where I, I'm looking at things that I know no one on this planet had seen before. Yeah, things hundreds of years old, and it gives you a buzz. It gives you a buzz. Going, wow, wow, and that drives you drives you to do a little bit more. You know, let's yeah. let's go here. What's around that corner? What's in that keyhole? So yeah, I mean the um, the challenge of technical diving is there. It's 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 a challenging route, but once you're there, the rewards uh, are endless. And I can't wait to get back to it. I'm, I'm excited to go cave diving now. I might just go look at my cave diving pictures now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to think about some warmer water. It's a bit cold down this side of the world. <laughs> oh mate, I I did a couple of months of training down at Mount Gambia just recently. Yeah. I was uh, teaching Ryan his um, uh, raid uh, rebreather 60 instructor course, mm -hmm. and I was teaching uh, Matt and a couple of guys from Altona uh, Dive Shop in um, Altona, um, their entry-level rebreather course, and I was diving in Coolsby's, 17 degrees, Matt. So when, <laughs> when, when you're used to 30-degree um, water in Thailand, yeah. to move into 17 degrees. And the boys down there were like, oh, it's a warm day, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mate, I'd, I'd have buy some uh, extra undergarments. So I didn't handle the cold <laughs> too well. But, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not great with it. We, I mean, we get, um, what are we, usually between 16 and, if we're lucky, 22, 23 in the height of summer. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I, I do go and dive and I enjoy diving here. However... 16 17 degrees it's 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 certainly the one that makes me decide to have an extra cup of coffee instead <laughs> <laughs> do you um use a dry suit um i did do and then i started hitting the gym so the dry suit i bought i outgrew um and then you know it's, i'm a bit reluctant to spend another couple of three yeah, grand on a, a suit that i'm gonna outgrow tool, again isn't it? it's expensive at all yeah. but um again like you want to dive you know some of those places in europe you know you want to long submersion in mexico florida mm. in those caves you you need to keep warm otherwise yeah. that's it that's it all over for you yeah, yeah. Uh, an old student of mine matt um steve lambert i taught him his entry level his entry level technical diving on kotel and i was at 
both bands. He um, he moved on to Rebreathers. We went back to the States, went back to Florida. He moved on to the Rebreathers, uh, uh, the Optima, chest-mounted Optima Rebreather. And um, he's been um, throwing himself into the cave community there in Florida. And last weekend he just did an eight-and-a-half-hour eight and cave dive some exploration, dropped another like 500 metres of line in a cave passage that he and his mates had found. And, you know, for me as as an initial instructor, I, I get a real buzz out of seeing my previous students just kicking ass and oh, yeah. doing cool stuff in, in technical diving. You know, I've, I've watched uh, the progress of quite a few of my students and, Sometimes I think they've surpassed what I've done. <laughs> and I'm like, right, I've got to get back. I've got to get back out there and do some more. <laughs> oh, it's fascinating. It's really cool because that's that's what you're seeing with technical, you know. It's just there's such a long journey with it. And going back to recreational, you can only go so far to recreational. Yeah. And I find with people with a real true passion of diving do eventually migrate into tech and once they realise the learning curve is there is exponential, it's 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 a whole lifetime of adventure right there in front yeah. of you, you know. Yeah. Well, this has been a bit of an adventure in itself, mate. Um, I think we'll I think we'll wrap it up for now. Okay, mate. And, um, it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, buddy, and and seeing you. It's been far too long. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I'm, I'm scared to say it, but we'll probably have a beer again <laughs> at some point. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, next year they're having uh, Oztech. You'll be you'll be down there, won't you? In Sydney, uh, they're doing it in Melbourne next year. Oh yeah, it was it okay. was supposed to be this year, but obviously COVID yeah. put a halt to those plans. But they're, I think they're doing it in September next year in Melbourne. Okay. Yeah, somewhere. I'll, so I'll be going. Look into that, mate. Make sure you get down there because um, I'll no, definitely I'll definitely be there for sure. But yeah, we may see each other in Cape Town, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> mate, Rug- Rugby, been... World, Rugby World Cup's next year, mate. Is it? Oh, don't. Is it next year or the year after? That's oh, 2023. I, was going to say, I know a nice bar on yeah, Kotel yeah. where we can go watch the rugby together. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of carnage. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Matt. I really appreciate yeah. it. I enjoyed the time with you, mate. Good to see you again. You too, buddy. It's been great. Thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks, everybody. This is Scuba Goat Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver.